In today's brief, we'll talk about the important yet oft overlooked story of Georgia, where Russia did a dry run for its full scale invasion of Ukraine. But first, a quick update on the war. Privit from Kyiv. I'm Rob Gaudet, contributing editor, and today is Sunday, September 3rd, 2023. You're listening to the Ukraine War Brief Podcast, where we bring you up to speed on the war in Ukraine in about 20 minutes or less. Today's episode is a little different. I'm going to look back at the Russian invasions of Georgia and what we can learn or should have learned from the full-scale invasion of Georgia in 2008. We'll also take a look at what it means for Ukraine and beyond. Before I dive in, I'll cover major developing stories happening this weekend. I'll start in the southern theater of operations, specifically the Orkhiv operational direction in Zaporizhia Oblast. Quick side note here. The Armed Forces of Ukraine, or AFU, refers to this operational direction as the Tavria direction. Tavria refers to the steppes in southern Ukraine between the Dnieper and Molochna rivers, and includes the Crimean Peninsula. Brigadier General Oleksandr Tarnavsky, commander of the Tavria Operational and Strategic Group of Forces, stated in an interview with The Observer that Ukraine has now breached the first line of Russian defense to the south and east of Robotne. The Wall Street Journal and geolocated footage verifies this claim. Tarnavsky said the AFU is in between the first and second lines of defense, of which there are three, and he estimated that Russia spent about 60% of its time and resources on the first line of defense, but only 20% on the second and third lines of defense. He further stated Russians weren't expecting a breakthrough of the first line of defense. Satellite footage shows shelling south and east of Novoprokopivka and Pishenichne, a settlement only about 15 kilometers from the outskirts of Tokmak, is likely up next for the Ukrainian advance. Putting Tokmak in artillery range would put Russian supply lines, called GLOCs or ground lines of communication, that supply Melitopol under Ukrainian fire. Severing the P-37 to T-401 and T-813 highway junctions in Tokmak would prevent occupation forces from supplying Melitopol by road from the east. Even more devastating for Russia would be the severing of the east-west railway hub in Tokmak, on which Russian logistics are based. Severing these G-locks, especially if a full liberation of Tokmak were to take place, would allow Ukraine to isolate all of southern Ukraine and make the advance to Melitopol and, eventually Crimea, much easier and safer. We cannot overstate what an accomplishment this breakthrough is, and we'll have more to say on tomorrow's episode. The battle will likely continue slowly as surgical demining, along with precision strikes on Russian artillery, aircraft, ammo depots, and trenches take place. Tokmak is heavily fortified, but the combat strength of defense forces there is likely weak. In other major news from the Eastern Theater of Operations, Colonel General Oleksandr Sirsky, commander of the ground forces of Ukraine, said the AFU is advancing in Bakhmut. Geolocated footage shows the AFU making advances in Klishchivka, although the fog of war is still thick. I would not be surprised if Russian defenses start failing around Bakhmut, given that Ukraine has almost severed all G-locks to the city, and now controls the high ground from which it can fire artillery. Together, these advances force Russia to make tough decisions about where to deploy defensive forces. And finally, on the home front, President Zelensky's statement after meeting with police during the Stavka was prescient. As we reported yesterday, he said the government will, quote, continue to cleanse the state of those who are still trying to weaken Ukraine from the inside. Autumn should be fruitful in this manner, end quote. Well, autumn came quickly. Yesterday, the Security Service of Ukraine, or SBU, arrested notorious Ukrainian oligarch Ihor Kolomoisky. This is significant news. As many of you know, Zelensky was a comedian on a hit TV show where he played the president of Ukraine. Kolmoisky owned the network which aired the show, and his media conglomerates supported his campaign for the presidency. After Zelensky's election, Western observers were skeptical whether Kolmoisky exerted control over Zelensky. Apparently not. Kolomoisky, 
whose estimated net worth ranges from a casual $1 to $5 billion, was detained on suspicion of fraud and money laundering. Prosecutors accused Kolomoisky of laundering more than 500 million hryvnias from 2013 to 2020 in Western banking institutions. The United States Department of Justice indicted the oligarch and his associates in August 2020 for large-scale bank fraud. He was banned from entering the country, except in handcuffs, the following year. As owner of Privatbank, $5 billion went missing, and the bank became so insolvent that it was nationalized in 2016 by the Ukrainian government. In July 2022, Zelensky stripped Kolomoisky of his Ukrainian citizenship. Under the Ukrainian constitution, dual citizenship is not permitted, but the oligarch holds both Cypriot and Israeli citizenship. Kolmoisky, the 2014-2016 to governor of Dnipropetrovsk Oblast, also faces investigation for tax evasion related to his energy holdings. Ukraine doesn't have an extradition treaty with the United States, but Israel and Cyprus do. We'll have more coverage on this story in tomorrow's episode. Now, on to our previously scheduled programming. The Invasion of Georgia, Part 1 Introduction. August 7th, 2023 marked the 15th anniversary of the full-scale Russian invasion of Georgia in 2008. To this day, Russia still controls the so-called republics of South Ossetia and Abkhazia. I'm going to refer to South Ossetia as the Shinvali region, because South Ossetia is a made-up name exploited by the Russians for their imperial pursuits. To oversimplify, Skinvali is a city and also a province in Georgia, similar to capital cities of oblasts in Ukraine. A lot of this will sound familiar to our most erudite of listeners, that's all of you, who've been following coverage of the war in Ukraine. We need to first understand a little bit about Georgia's geography. Georgia is a country of 3.7 million people and is about 70,000 square kilometers or about 27,000 square miles in area. That's a little bit bigger than Ireland. Nestled in the South Caucasus, it borders Russia to the north, the Black Sea to the west, Turkey, Armenia, and Azerbaijan to the south, and Russia and Azerbaijan to the east. Great neighborhood, huh? About a third of the country's population lives in or around the capital, Tbilisi, which is about 50 kilometers due north from the border with Armenia. The fake Republic of Abkhazia lies in the northwestern corner of the country, bordering the Black Sea to the west and Russia, of course, to the north. The fake Republic of South Ossetia lies about halfway along the northern Russian border, also, of course, The region of Russia that borders Georgia is the same one that Russia used to build the Kerch Bridge connecting Russia to Crimea, Krasnodar Krai. Part 2. The 1921 Invasion I'm not going to cover the centuries of conquest in the Caucasus from the Ottomans, Russians, etc., but like the Balkans, that history still mars the region today. I think the best starting point is in 1917. Following the Bolshevik Revolution in Russia, Georgia declared independence, drafted a constitution, and was, in many ways, ahead of its time. Georgia was an independent democracy from 1918 to 1921. The history is complicated, but Georgians elected a constituent assembly to create a written framework by which the country was to be self-governed. Although largely ethnic Georgian, the assembly was comprised of many ethnicities, including the Abkhaz, Ossetians, Greeks, and Armenians. Local autonomous rule was devolved for ethnic minorities in the new country, including for the Abkhaz. The constituent assembly's constitution was ahead of many contemporary democracies for its time. While most women in the West couldn't even vote, never mind hold public office, Georgians elected five women, including a Muslim woman, in the largely Georgian Orthodox country to the assembly. Switzerland, by contrast, didn't allow women to vote until the 70s. Sidebar here, besides my own dear beloved country, the United States, Switzerland and Germany are some of my favorite countries to pick on. Switzerland in particular. 
they've managed to stay neutral during three genocides on the European continent in the last century, including the current one in Ukraine, and helped Nazis flee justice through rat lines and even now allowed Credit Suisse to provide banking services to over 12,000 Nazis who escaped to South America. And then they covered it up. It didn't get a lot of press, but the United States Senate Budget Committee just released a report on this on August 17th following a subpoena to Credit Suisse. Don't get me started on the Vatican. Unlike the U.S. Constitution, the Georgian one provided that anyone arrested had to be presented to court within 24 hours of the arrest. It didn't have slavery. It didn't count slaves as three-fifths of a person for purposes of representation in Congress while simultaneously calling slaves property, and it included equal protection under law. Extremely importantly for this history, the Georgian constitution provided autonomous rule to the Abkhazia, Batumi, and Zakatala regions for finance, education, public health, and more. It not only devolved autonomous rule to these regions, but it also defined them geographically. Georgian independence in the early 20th century didn't last long. We don't know what would have happened had Georgia remained independent. The Bolsheviks consolidated power in Petrograd, now known as St. Petersburg, invaded Georgia and forced it to become part of the USSR by the early 1920s. And yes, war daddy Stalin, who succeeded Lenin, was Georgian. That didn't stop him from committing mass atrocities against the people of Georgia, his own people, in his deranged, paranoid, evil, ruthless, albeit successful, pursuit of power. Today, Stalin's legacy is used by Russia in its ongoing hybrid warfare against Georgia. And although it's a closely guarded secret, there's strong circumstantial evidence suggesting Putin was born to ethnic Russian occupiers living in Georgia during the time of the Soviet Union. Part 3. The 1991 Invasion Let's fast forward to around 1970. Eduard Shevardnadze was the first secretary of Georgia's Communist Party from 1972 to 1985, before Mikhail Gorbachev elevated him to foreign minister of the USSR from 1985 to 1990. When Georgia declared independence in April 1991, it elected Zviad Gamsakordia, a staunch Georgian nationalist and former Soviet dissident. The KGB, or KGB, under Shevardnadze, jailed Kamsagordia in the late 1970s and again in the early 80s for his nationalistic views. Of note, Georgia was the first non-Baltic country to declare independence from the USSR. The KGB and the Soviet apparatus employed a strategy of divide and rule, or divide and conquer. It identified existing fissures, or potential cracks, in society, and in Georgia's case, especially around ethnicity, and used propaganda, false flag operations, and other active measures to pit ethnicities against each other. And although the KGB was officially dissolved after the USSR collapsed, many of its operations continued under the guise of the FSB. A recent study in the Journal of Democracy, co-authored by Maria Snegovaya, found that 85% of Soviet government officials remained in their post following the dissolution of the USSR. That includes the KGB. Supposedly, President Gamsakordia stoked tensions in Abkhazia and the Chkinvali region. That's the fake Republic of South Ossetia. While Gamsakordia seemed paranoid and arrested political prisoners, he probably wasn't wrong to feel this way. Gamsakordia claimed that Boris Yeltsin demanded Georgia join the Commonwealth of Independent States, or CIS, a knockoff version of the EU. When he refused, Yeltsin authorized a bloody coup d'etat. It's not known whether Yeltsin, who had alcohol use disorder, was sober at the time of the authorization. In 2002, researchers revealed that Moscow authorized a covert operation to distribute heavy arms, including artillery, to future, quote, resistance fighters right after Gamsakordia's election. Russia armed nine Georgian, three Ossetian, and three Abkhaz militias before the coup and the subsequent civil war. Gamsakordia was later killed under mysterious circumstances after fleeing to Chechnya. Hint, uh, the Russians executed him. Of note, these Abkhazian and South Ossetian resistance fighters, appearing outwardly independent, 
actually reported directly into the Russian military command, specifically the GRU, or Military Intelligence Unit. After fighting for two to three years, Moscow, which instigated the war, brokered a, quote, peace by sending peacekeepers to Abkhazia and South Ossetia. This is important because the peacekeepers would later be used in 2008. Moscow's proxies set up a military council who appointed none other than former Soviet foreign minister and head of the Communist Party of the Georgian SVR, Eduard Shevardnadze, as leader. Shevardnadze pushed out rivals on the council and consolidated his rule, starting in 1992. He ruled by diktat, but scheduled elections in 1995. As a direct result of Russian aggression, Abkhazia's pre-war population fell by over half by up to 300,000 people, with at least 10,000 civilians murdered. Russian proxy forces committed ethnic cleansing of Georgians. To end the fighting, Georgia was forced to join the CIS. At the time, the CIS included Armenia, Azerbaijan, Belarus, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Russia, Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, honorary member Turkmenistan, Ukraine, and Moldova. Headquartered in Minsk, the CIS has been led by Belarusian self-declared potato king Alexander Lukashenko's sycophant Ivan Karachenya and Russia's Boris Berezovsky, Uri Yarov, Vladimir Lushailo, and Sergei Lebedev, who's held the position since October 2007, is a former KGB officer, former general of the Russian Armed Forces, and former director of the SVR, Russian's Foreign Intelligence Agency. Not surprisingly, every single peacekeeper was Russian. Where was the West when this happened? Well, President George H.W. Bush's Secretary of State, James Baker, visited Tbilisi in 1992, welcoming Shevardnadze after frequently criticizing the human rights abuses of Gamsakordia. Baker served previously as Ronald Reagan's Chief of Staff, as the U.S. Treasury Secretary, and then as George H.W. Bush's Chief of Staff from 1992 to 1993 before exiting government. He promised Gorbachev that NATO wouldn't move, quote, one inch closer east, end quote, if Gorbachev allowed the reunification of Germany. He also didn't believe the Soviet Union should have been dissolved. In 2003, the second President Bush sent Baker to chastise Shevardnadze that free and fair elections must be held later that year. Shevardnadze didn't comply. After leaving government, Baker worked for Enron and subsequently voted for Donald Trump in both the 2016 and 2020 elections. The United States was eager to form, quote, normal relations with Russia and turned a blind eye to its malign actions in the region. Western Europe even more so. The only voices of reason were coming from those countries formerly behind the Iron Curtain, and they were largely ignored. Former foreign minister and president of Estonia, Tomas Ilves, said it well. Estonians are effective communicators to the West because they don't come off as, quote, hysterical, end quote. In my personal view, countries formerly under Russian control have every right to sound hysterical, even though it might not be the most effective diplomatic communication strategy. The U.S. was also fixated on securing nuclear weapons from countries formerly under Moscow's rule. These countries, but not Russia, were seen as unstable. So, in exchange for ill-defined security guarantees, the United States transferred the nuclear weapons of the former Soviet states to the most irresponsible country of them all, Russia. So myopic was the West's vision that it let the opportunity to secure a permanent European peace slip by. Part 4. The 2008 Invasion Let's move on and set the scene prior to the full-scale invasion of Georgia in 2008. Shevardnadze's coalition parties won the parliamentary elections in 1999 and 2003 in what were widely considered rigged elections. The 2003 election was particularly egregious, and the country was in a calamitous state. Corruption was rife, infrastructure was in total disrepair, human rights were ignored, and the economy was in a tailspin. Opposition parties won the elections according to independent exit polls, but Shevardnadze still declared victory. Opposition leader Mikhail Saakashvili encouraged Georgians to protest the false election results, 
From November 3rd to November 23rd, up to 50,000 people took to the streets of Tbilisi and demanded the resignation of Shevardnadze and a rerun of the elections. On November 23rd, Shevardnadze resigned. New elections were held six weeks later, and Saakashvili won 96% of the vote, having run unopposed. The event became known as the Rose Revolution because the protesters who stormed parliament had roses in hand. A second Rose Revolution occurred in the autonomous Batumi region. Thousands of protesters took to the streets on May 6, 2004, and, with the support of Saakashvili's government, toppled the dictator Aslan Abachidze, who fled to Russia after being deposed. Both revolutions were entirely peaceful. Russian propaganda created a narrative that this was a coup orchestrated by a small minority of Georgians, despite evidence to the contrary. Saakashvili, who received an advanced law degree from Columbia University, immediately implemented pro-EU, pro-NATO, and pro-democratic reforms. He lifted press restrictions, fired and replaced corrupt public officials, raised public official salaries so they didn't have to depend on bribes, arrested oligarchs, cracked down on tax evasion, courted foreign investment, and rebuilt key infrastructure. He also reformed libel laws, eliminated the death penalty, liberalized the economy, and was credited by Western observers for turning Georgia from a failed state into an up-and-coming democracy. To be clear, Saakashvili wasn't a saint in office, and he earned plenty of enemies. Protests erupted in 2007 because he arrested opposition leaders and raided their television stations. In response, he declared early elections and then resigned. The Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, or OSEE, determined his re-election in early 2008 was not free and fair. However, I question whether he had a choice given the events that followed later that year, plus the extent of Russia's influence over Georgia. The now infamous Bucharest NATO summit held in April 2008 left Georgia and Ukraine holding the bag. The United States, Canada, UK, Poland, Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia, Hungary, and all Central European member states were strongly for extending a formal NATO membership action plan, or MAP, to both Ukraine and Georgia. Angela Merkel's Germany, Nicolas Sarkozy's France, and Berlusconi's Italy, along with the Netherlands and Belgium, were opposed to offering the map to Ukraine and Georgia. U.S. President Bush apparently made Chancellor Merkel, quote, very upset and even angry, end quote, in his insistence of offering NATO membership to the two countries. Perhaps if Bush had not wasted his political capital by illegally invading Iraq, Merkel and Sarkozy would have folded. I doubt it, though. Merkel's family chose to move from West Germany to East Germany when she was an infant, and she had a portrait of Catherine II in her office. Notably, Merkel has not apologized or expressed any regret in her appeasement policy towards Russia. She does not regret building the Nord Stream 1 and uncompleted Nord Stream 2 pipelines. Germany, emblematic of most Western European countries, considered Russia a problematic but ultimately pragmatic partner. Sarkozy, a notorious Russophile, is facing significant legal troubles related to corruption and bribery at home. It should be noted that he had the ear of French President Emmanuel Macron until recently. The most Kafkaesque part of the NATO summit was Putin's invitation. The Russian president-slash-dictator-slash-wanted war criminal even gave a speech opposing a map for Georgia and Ukraine. His deputy foreign minister said, quote, Ukraine's NATO membership would create a profound crisis between Kyiv and Moscow, with a negative impact on the security of Europe, end quote and that extending a map to both nations would be a, quote, huge strategic mistake. The NATO communique that year said Ukraine and Georgia would eventually become members, but NATO's defense ministers would later decide in December. On December 4, 2008, NATO's defense ministers announced the great military power and not at all corrupt Montenegro was given a map, but Ukraine and Georgia still needed to make progress. Russia knew immediately after Bucharest that NATO wasn't going to intervene in any armed intervention in Georgia. 
On June 30th, 2008, Alexander Dugin, remember him? His daughter was killed in a car bomb. The ultra-nationalist and fascist gave a speech in Skinvali saying Georgian, quote, enclaves were the last remaining barrier to independence and that South Ossetia's independence would block Georgia's accession to NATO. Therefore, independence of South Ossetia would need to be achieved by December. December is when the NATO defense ministers were going to meet. In the summer of 2008, the United States conducted a small counterinsurgency training exercise with the Georgian Armed Forces, with a focus on the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. Russia would use this exercise to say the United States was training Georgia on how to invade Shkinvali, as if one can invade itself. In late July 2008, Russian Armed Forces conducted massive exercises along the Georgian border. Instead of going home, however, they kept their troops there. Russia also sent soldiers and military equipment to Abkhazia under the guise of the, quote, peacekeeping mission in violation of the 1992 South Ossetia and 1993 Abkhazia ceasefires that Russia itself brokered. On August 1, 2008, Russian forces in Skinvali shelled Georgian villages. The artillery fire intensified immensely on August 6. And Saakashvili was forced to send troops to maintain Georgia's territorial integrity and to protect its citizens. By August 7th, Georgian forces controlled most of the Shkinvali region. But, and this is a very important but, a significant number of Russian ground forces had already crossed into Georgian territory before Saakashvili's response. Russia launched the air, sea, and land full-scale invasion on Saturday, August 8th, the day of the opening ceremony of the 2008 Beijing Olympics. Russian propaganda, which is part of its so-called hybrid warfare techniques, claimed Georgia's response was a provocation against Russia and accused Georgia of committing genocide. They accused Saakashvili of going crazy, using drugs, and committing genocide against Ossetians, Abkhazians, and Russians. The propaganda machine also created ambiguity, twisting Western media's tendency to present two sides of an argument as equally valid. Ambiguity presents a lie and a fact as two equally valid sides of an argument. Nascent social media was also used to spread lies. RT and Western useful idiots were also leveraged to espouse Russian talking points about the invasion. Russia carried out simultaneous cyber attacks on Georgia, and Russian propagandists were sent to the occupied areas to proclaim Russia was liberating Ossetians, and most of all, ethnic Russians. Saakashvili, in an effort to show good faith, declared a unilateral ceasefire for several hours, but eventually responded militarily. He did not have a choice. By land and air, Russia invaded through occupied Shkinvali and Abkhazia. The region's geography is so mountainous, it required advanced planning to move massive amounts of troops over the Caucasus Mountains into Georgian territory. Georgian forces, to their credit, were able to wound Russian Lieutenant General leading the column of the invading ground forces, Anatoly Krylyov. Former member of Georgian Parliament, Georgi Kandalaki, said on the Power Vertical podcast he saw a radar with 54 Russian aircraft in Georgian airspace. As Russian forces advanced towards Tbilisi, Russians indiscriminately bombed hospitals, critical civilian infrastructure, conducted filtration, targeted ethnic Georgians for execution, killed journalists, and committed many other war crimes and atrocities, especially in the city of Gori. Ships from the Black Sea Fleet in Sevastopol, which the Ukrainian government had leased to Russia, note this lease was foisted upon Ukraine, blockaded Georgia's ports, destroyed Georgian ships, and blockaded Georgia's economy. Russian ground forces advanced 25 kilometers from Tbilisi, destroying much of the city in airstrikes and with artillery. On August 12th, U.S. President Bush, flanked by U.S. Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice and U.S. Secretary of Defense Bob Gates, announced that humanitarian aid would be delivered to Georgia via Black Sea ports. The invasion stopped within 10 minutes of the announcement. Secretary Rice immediately flew between Brussels and Tbilisi to secure a ceasefire. The U.S. denied Saakashvili's request for military aid, but approved humanitarian assistance instead. The rotating head of the EU presidency was occupied by corrupt Russophile Nicolas Sarkozy of France, 
the same Sarkozy that prevented Georgia from joining NATO months earlier. Russian President slash Putin puppet Dmitry Medvedev agreed to a six-point ceasefire plan. Russia only agreed to the ceasefire plan when Sarkozy forced Saakashvili to accept points five and six. The points were, one, never use force, two, definitive cessation of hostilities, three, free access to humanitarian aid, four, Georgian military forces must withdraw to their normal bases of encampment, five, Russian military forces must withdraw to the lines prior to the start of hostilities. While awaiting an international mechanism, Russian peacekeeping forces will implement additional security measures. And six, opening of the international discussions on the modalities of lasting security in Abkhazia and South Ossetia. You can see how points five and six of this so-called peace plan are ill-defined, ambiguous, and open-ended. If you're enjoying the episode, please rate us and leave a review on whatever podcast platform you're listening on. If you have any questions, comments, or concerns, please feel free to reach out to us via email at social at borlingen.media. That's B-O-R-L-I-N-G-O-N dot media. Part 5. The Aftermath. Former MP Kondalaki correctly concluded that the ambiguity in the ceasefire agreement invited further aggression. Russia didn't abide by the ceasefire agreement, it never withdrew its troops from Skinvali or Abkhazia, and it still occupies 20% of Georgian territory today. Drunk puppet Dmitry Medvedev recently said Russia should proceed with the annexation of South Ossetia and Abkhazia. Hybrid warfare continues in Georgia to this day. After the war's conclusion, if one can call it that, and U.S. President Obama's, frankly speaking, idiotic reset with Russia policy, Saakashvili was severely weakened. The West showed that it would never allow Georgia to join NATO, and, in denying a NATO map, showed it wouldn't check Russian aggression in what the West perceived as Russia's sphere of influence. Saakashvili's perceived shortcomings, including a legitimate prison torture scandal, an expose on gathering compromat on politicians, businessmen, and journalists by filming them having sex with prostitutes or men, shutting down TV stations, and arresting opposition figures, further weakened his standing at home. In hindsight, Saakashvili shutting down TV stations and arresting opposition figures may have been the correct thing to do, given what followed. In 2012, in a largely free and fair election, Saakashvili lost to the Georgian Dream Party, led by Bidzina Ivanishvili, whose Georgian citizenship was stripped by Saakashvili's government. Ivanishvili, whose net worth is estimated north of $6 billion, made all of his money in Russia in the 1990s, had no previous political experience, and likely worked with Russian intelligence to exploit Saakashvili's weaknesses to gain power. For example, Georgia Dream promised there would be no war with Russia. This message, of course, resonated with Georgian voters, who obviously didn't want another war, but couldn't count on NATO membership. There would be no war with Russia because the Georgian Dream Party would just do what Moscow wanted. Ivanishvili stated in 2012 that Georgia should emulate Armenia's foreign policy, which is very pro-Russian. He slowly purged pro-EU, pro-NATO, and pro-Western voices from government. Russians fleeing from mobilization from the war in Ukraine have fled in the hundreds of thousands to Georgia, creating another pretext to, quote, liberate Russian speakers by Moscow and potentially invade Georgia should Ivanishvili's government ever be overthrown. Georgia is currently helping Russia evade sanctions, and daily flights to Moscow from Tbilisi, long since canceled, have resumed. Georgia Dream has blocked Russian dissidents from seeking asylum. Just two days ago, the woman who holds the largely ceremonial role of President of Georgia, Salome Zorabishvili, visited the EU to drum up support for Georgia's candidacy status. Puppet Prime Minister Arakli Garibashvili immediately moved to impeach her for, quote, violating the country's constitution. Democratic backsliding is happening in Georgia using the KGB playbook from the 90s. Instead of dividing Georgian society along ethnic lines, Georgia Dream is dividing society along religious ones. By portraying themselves as protectors of traditional Christian values, they pit the rights of the LGBTQ community against good, moral Christians. Puppet PM Garabashvili recently attended the Conservative Political Action Committee, CPAC, conference in Budapest. 
Turkey is Erdogan, Hungary's Orban, Aliyev's Azerbaijan, the United States is Trump, and due Poland have all used the same, quote, protector of family values messaging to erode democratic institutions. Professor Gia Nodia, political scientist at the prominent Ilya State University in Tbilisi, notes that Ivanishvili effectively controls the Georgian government. Georgia is on the cusp of becoming the new Belarus. I'd add the people of Georgia, consistently and since independence, have demonstrated much more animosity towards Russia than the people of Belarus or even Moldova. Moldova, Ukraine, and Georgia were given interim EU candidacy status, all applied after the full-scale invasion in Ukraine began. Georgia, however, was granted a form of informal candidacy status. Professor Nodia also notes that unlike Ukraine, which the Georgian people desperately want to win the war, Georgian civil society may not yet be advanced enough to consolidate and strengthen its political institutions. Unlike Ukraine and Moldova, Georgia isn't clearly rooting out corruption, strengthening democratic institutions, and forcefully pushing back against Russia. Saakashvili, for his part, enthusiastically supported the Revolution of Dignity in Ukraine in February 2014. After Ivanishvili's government issued a politically motivated arrest warrant for him in August 2014, he moved to Williamsburg in New York City. In May 2015, he was granted Ukrainian citizenship by President Petro Poroshenko and was appointed governor of Odessa Oblast with a remit to fight corruption in the port city. Poroshenko refused to extradite him to Georgia. The Georgian government stripped him of Georgian citizenship. He resigned as governor of Odessa Oblast in November 2016, about a year and a half into his tenure, citing intractable corruption by enemies of Ukraine and Poroshenko's support of them. He wasn't wrong. The Panama Papers showed that the mayor of the city of Odessa, Gennady Trukhanov, secretly held Russian citizenship, which is illegal under the Ukrainian constitution, and laundered money through a crime syndicate by buying London real estate. He was arrested by Ukrainian authorities in May 2023 for embezzling $18.5 million. After his release on bail, he was arrested again for corruption and remains behind bars awaiting trial. Poroshenko revoked Saakashvili's Ukrainian citizenship, rendering him stateless. President Zelensky restored his Ukrainian citizenship in 2019. He returned to Georgia in 2021 to help unite the opposition, but was taken into custody. A court appearance by video earlier in 2023 showed him emaciated and weak as he continues his hunger strike. Part 6. Comparisons to Ukraine Let's start with the similarities. In 2004, Ukrainians took to the streets to protest rigged elections that purported to put corrupt President Sushma's political ally, Viktor Yanukovych, in power. This Orange Revolution was partly inspired by the Rose Revolution in Georgia. Yanukovych lost to Viktor Yushchenko, and Yushchenko assumed the presidency without incident. In 2010, Yanukovych, on the advice of convicted criminal and U.S. Republican Party operative Paul Manafort, who went on to lead the 2016 Trump campaign, won election. After Yanukovych abruptly pulled out of talks to expand ties to the EU in 2013, Ukrainians overthrew Yanukovych during the Euromaidan movement, which culminated in the Revolution of Dignity. Shortly after the Revolution of Dignity, Russia annexed Crimea and covertly invaded the Donbass under the guise of a separatist movement. Yanukovych fled to Moscow, where he still lurks. Russia used the same propaganda tactics as in Georgia, creating false narratives for Western media, resulting in a tepid Western response in 2014. Our sister podcast, produced by Ukrainian news outlet Svidomi Media, called FAQU, Ukraine Explained, goes in-depth about the information war Russia prosecutes in Ukraine and in the West. Some narratives call Zelensky a drug addict, crazy, corrupt, and allege that Ukraine is full of Nazis. They also constantly threatened to escalate with the West. Russian troops conducted large-scale exercises on the Ukrainian border in October 2021 to test the response. By February 2022, troops amassed on the border were getting ready to invade. Russia, just like in Georgia, has committed war crimes in Ukraine, targeting civilians, civilian infrastructure, and journalists, 
using cluster munitions on civilians, torturing children, raping men, women, and children, deporting children, ethnically cleansing Crimean Tatar and Ukrainian populations in occupied regions, and brainwashing local populations with propaganda on the internet, on state TV, and in school textbooks. The anemic, slow reaction of the West in 2014 and the anemic, slow reaction of the West in 2022 in providing necessary equipment has cost Ukrainian lives and delayed victory. There is still a fear of, quote, provoking Russia. Now, the differences. After Russia's full-scale invasion began, Ukraine showed it could fight the occupiers. Zelensky's show of bravery galvanized the West and its allies, led by President Biden, to drastically increase military, economic, and humanitarian aid to Ukraine. Although Biden is old, he spent decades in the Senate, and then eight years as vice president. Unlike all other presidents since the fall of the USSR, Biden seemed to recognize the threat. Populations in the West and allied democracies were also galvanized by Ukrainian resistance. Ukraine's information campaign, including a savvy social media strategy, influences the public to continue to support Ukraine. Mealy-mouthed statements from political leaders are often met with backlash in the allied democracies. The Pew Research Center shows anti-Putin and anti-Russia sentiment has grown significantly. Western audiences largely can see basic Russian propaganda when they encounter it, although they still may struggle to identify more subtle forms of propaganda. The NAFO OFAN phenomenon, or the North Atlantic Fellows Organization, is a decentralized online campaign to troll Russian talking points on social media. Russian officials are clearly irritated by it. The strategic declassification of intelligence was instrumental and innovative. I am not talking about anonymous leaks to the New York Times or Build here. The United States regained credibility by warning Russia was going to invade Ukraine. The release of the intelligence also helped counter Russian narratives and fortified Western populations against Russian propaganda. The declassifications continue and are a crucial part of the war effort. There seems to be a realization among NATO, excluding Hungary and, to some extent, Turkey, and major allies, Japan, the Republic of Korea, New Zealand, and Australia, that a Russian victory in Ukraine would show China, regarded by the United States and many other allies as its largest strategic threat, that they can annex territory as well, including Taiwan. And finally, the governments of Sweden and Finland realized accession to NATO is much more important for peace than remaining neutral. Unfortunately, Malta, Cyprus, the Vatican, Austria, and Switzerland don't seem to understand that. Part 7. Takeaways. What conclusions can we draw from the history in Georgia as compared to the current war in Ukraine? For one, Russia backs down when it's in a corner. Allies of Ukraine must provide the country with everything it needs including, but not limited to, attackums, clamping down on sanctions evasion, especially within the NATO bloc, 155mm artillery ammunition, demining equipment, short-range air defense capabilities, or SHORAD, and drones. Ukrainians aren't afraid of Russia, and neither should their allies be. They should be more afraid of a Russian victory, which would include a, quote, frozen conflict, end quote, that could be restarted in 10 to 20 years. NATO and the EU should be asking Ukraine to join them, not the other way around. A decisive Russian defeat could, if strategic planning is in place, help Moldova and Georgia join the family of democratic societies. A Russian defeat could also help stabilize the Sahel and democratically aligned African governments, destabilize the Iranian government led by the Imam of Flying Mopeds, Ayatollah Khomeini, destabilize the government led by failed ophthalmologist Bashar al-Assad in Syria, send a warning to the sixth-grade educated so-called President Xi Jinping of China not to invade Taiwan, and send a message to Orban, Erdogan, Modi, and other dictators that the alliance of democracies must be taken seriously. I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the important message it would also send to Little Russia, also known as Serbia, and its malign influence in destabilizing the Balkans. A Marshall Plan for the Black Sea and beyond is needed when Russia loses. NATO allies Turkey, Romania, and Bulgaria all depend on the Black Sea for trade. The world relies on the Black Sea for energy and food security. Georgia and Ukraine must be included in the plan. Ukraine's economy is dependent on the critical ports of Mariupol and Odessa on the Black Sea for its economic development.
we must fortify defenses against Russian propaganda. It is not Orwellian to be media literate. Journalism schools should move away from teaching that there are two sides to every single story. Sometimes a lie is a lie. As Georgia and Ukraine have taught us, false equivalency can kill. We also must remember that Georgia was first invaded well before Putin came to power. This is not Putin's war. This is Russia's war. For all the intrigue about Putin's position, we must view Russia and Muscovites as the imperialists that they are. Through this lens, democratically aligned countries can plan strategically and respond forcefully when Russia inevitably continues to pursue its expansionist aims. And finally, and this may be controversial, but in my opinion it's true, until a fundamental shift in the death cult society that is Russia occurs, such as, say, the imposition of a denazification program, Russia and ethnic Russians must be monitored and contained. The USSR collapsed in 1991. Before that, the Tsarist Empire collapsed in 1917. No matter the government, monarchist, communist, or fascist, ethnic Russians, glorified Mongol tax collectors that they are, maintain a zeitgeist of claiming the victim while being the aggressor. Even so-called liberal Russians should be treated with skepticism, with the notable exceptions of Vladimir Karamorza and Boris Nemtsov. Russians don't integrate well in foreign societies. Just last week, a Russian threw a 10-year-old child off a bridge in Germany for speaking Ukrainian. Radio Svoboda journalist Elizabeth Mayadnaya, who was living in Latvia with her family, quote, almost cried, end quote, when the government closed all Russian-speaking schools, forcing her high school-aged son to take classes in Latvian. And just today, a leaked Russian document shows the Russian plans for Ukraine are basically what Hitler's plans were for Poland. When we say never again, do we really mean it? End note. I'd like to extend enormous thanks to the academics cited in this piece for their research. Visit Georgi Kondalaki and his team's work at the Soviet Past Research Laboratory, or SovLab, at sovlab.ge to learn more about Georgian history. Subscribe to Brian Whitmore's The Power Vertical podcast and our sister podcast co-produced with Svodomi Media, FAQU, Ukraine Explained. Follow the work of Professors Rory Finnan, Timothy Snyder, Gia Nodia, Maria Snegovaya, and Brian Whitmore, whom I relied on for this episode. Also give Tomas Hendricks Ilves, President of Estonia from 2006 to 2016 and Minister of Foreign Affairs of Estonia from 1996 to 1999, a follow on social media. His sharp wit, clear-eyed view of Russia, and fantastic bow ties are invaluable and entertaining. The links are in the description. That's the less brief brief for today. Remember to check your sources and don't fall for propaganda. Join us on YouTube and TikTok for more Ukraine content and live news reports. And please consider supporting our work on Substack. You'll find the links in the description. We'll be back with more updates. And until then, stay safe, everyone.